Good evening and welcome. The Theatre of Life. Everything that happens to us in our lives, whether we are born into a poor family in the mountains of Peru, or into the British royal family, whether we have parents who are alcoholics or vegan, or maybe both, whether we live in a country who, where there is peace or where there is war, what teachers we have at school, who we meet and maybe fall in love with, if we have plenty of friends or whether we are lonely, which profession we choose, if we live a long and happy life or die early of some illness, or if we become Hollywood stars, racing drivers, or the Secretary General of the UN, or just live quiet, peaceful life. This gigantic theater that takes place every minute of the whole of this globe, and actually not only on this globe, but on other globes, and actually the entire physical universe. Every minute. What is it all about? Why does it happen the way it happens? And who is it really who decides our fate? Well, through Martina's world picture, we learn that it is we ourselves, to 100%, who create our own fate. But is there anyone in this audience who has never been surprised at where you ended up in life? or never had anything unexpected happen to you. It seems as if we've got quite a bit more to learn about how to create our own fate. And we definitely need more of the energy of intuition in order to understand it all more in detail. And maybe we need to have cosmic consciousness before we really know. But this evening we will through some of Martinez's articles, mainly, have a little bit of a closer look at this theater of life and how we can learn more about how to create a happy fate. Because I think that's something fundamental. We all wish to do that. Here's a bit of definition first. Martinus uses the term science of fate. And in Livy's book two, he writes, this information about the reaction faculty of spiritual or cosmic substances, in other words, cosmic, cosmic chemistry, is thus nothing less than the science of fate. Well, maybe it's not so easy to decipher what this is about. Um, it's, just, uh, it's short, but this information in the sentence refers to all our life experiences, everything we, we go through, and also the information we get when we study uh, the spiritual world picture. So with that information about the reaction faculty of spiritual or cosmic substances, that is the basic energies. And that is what we juggle with all day, every day, to mix these substances uh, and hopefully achieve what we want. And that is learning this, or learning about this, is learning the science of fate. And in an, a little article, he defines it as this, like this. Our fate is the same as the connection of our present with our past and our future. And life's fate drama is therefore a presentation or display of these three different kinds of time, past, present, and future, constitute three groups of actors in the fate drama, and our own role is the present. Ah, so we are an actor in our own fate drama, of course, and our role is the present. And 
in order to be able to learn from our experiences, um, it's useful to try to distinguish who, where we find these actors. If the present is ourselves, then we must have some who are the future and other that are our past. So let's go on and see what he says about this. Just a moment. Here, yeah. our past is played by all the fellow beings whose mentality exactly reaches the level which constitutes that still unfinished, primitive and undeveloped part of our own consciousness. Through them we meet now what we have sown in the past. And this is maybe not always easy. It depends what it is we meet. It's not easy always to accept and be grateful if we find that somebody is deceiving us or somebody talks badly about us, spreads lies or bad rumors about us. Um, then it's not, and if it, we find it hurtful, um, which would be natural. But on the other hand, this knowledge is extremely useful and it makes it much easier for us to understand and forgive this person, knowing that we have sowed this in our past. And here we have it displayed in front of us. So it increases our tolerance and our ability to forgive, instead of possibly despising those who represent our past. So this knowledge can really help, even if it maybe doesn't help at the first instance. If it's painful, it is painful. But if we then start to think about it and pray, and knowing that it is our past, and knowing that the road forward is to accept and forgive, um, is very helpful, even if it can take time. And this knowledge can also radically change our way of acting. And I wonder, have you ever been in a situation that you think you might probably have turned your back to if you did not have these analyses? That you would run away from? And that knowing that this is something I need to learn something of, from, and it represents my past. So if I don't take the challenge now, I'll take it later. And of course, sometimes maybe we have to wait uh, and take it later. But I believe that you might have experienced something similar. And then we have that we also meet beings who have overcome some, quite a number of the foolishnesses and imperfections to which we might still submit. Yeah, let's take that first. Yeah, this is a bit more pleasant, meeting those who, who represent our future um, and who, who are ahead of us. They often act as role models for us, as people who we admire and, and uh, they can wake our long, the longing in us to, to reach their degree of love or uh, intellectuality or ability to forgive or whatever. And I guess you all have role models. Um, perhaps you're not so aware of them, but I'm sure there are. Uh, I'm sure you have. I find that I can have uh, role models of uh, peacemakers with great courage. They sort of make me, oh, wow. Nelson Mandela, Malala, who else are there? Um, Dag Hammarskjöld, and there are many more. Um, and longing is important. We'll come back to that later. Um, and realizing that when I feel a strong longing for something, um, that 
I will, if, I will reach it. I will reach there eventually. And accepting the gap and knowing that life is a journey and if my longing is really sincere and deep and I'm not hopefully hurting anybody with it, I will get there, reach there one day. And now, our task is to combine the past with the future and thereby perfect the place integrity and unity for the spectator, which consequently means for ourselves. The spectator is also in us. It's the one who reflects and thinks over what is taking place. But what might Martinus mean by the play's integrity and unity? I'm not quite sure. You'll have to think for yourselves. Maybe it is that... Um, I try to think sometimes, well, as long as I try to learn as much as I can from what I'm experiencing, I can't learn more than I can. If I do my best, that will have to be enough, isn't it? So let's hope that it's something like that he means. And now let's imagine a little fate drama. And let's go into the past. It's sometimes a bit easier to look at the past than to look at one's, future, one's uh, present. Uh, so this is, I've just put this together with my own imag imagination. It's not from Martinez' analysis. I'm trying to use them, though. Uh, let's imagine we're in um, act number 22 after Christ. Um, the scene is Europe in the Middle Ages. And here we have the main character, who is the present, represents the, for, yeah, she represents the present in her own, um, in her own theater of life. And let's call her Meg. And we also have somebody courting her, it looks like. Let's call him Gavin. And let's say they get married. And he will probably represent both the past, her past, and possibly also her future. And so she will also find the past, her past and her future amongst her family and amongst friends. And, well, we all find our past and our future amongst family, friends and colleagues. And let's speculate a little bit with these uh, Meg and Gavin. Who does Gavin represent for Meg? Well, maybe he's a clever merchant, good at negotiating and creating benefit and profit for um, himself and for his family. And my guess is that she admires him for that. Um, Meg, I think she has a longing to learn to read and learn to use language in other areas than at home and with her, fam with her family and children. So there he represents her future and awakens her longing. And then one can speculate what do they represent for each other in the relation of the pole transformation, which means the masculine pole that is growing in Meg and the feminine pole that is growing in, in Gavin. Well, maybe Gavin is more possessive, jealous and dominant then Meg is submissive and a devoted wife. I'm speculating. And maybe Meg is more satiated with, in being submissive than Gavin is satiated being the one in power or more control. And maybe she, with her masculine pole, manipulates Gavin and dominates the children. I don't know. Um, sometimes it's very obvious in a situation that... Uh, one person represents the future. And when one finds oneself in that situation, realizing that, oops, in this area, I have more experience than the person I'm in the situation with. Um, and um, I know more about this. 
can be a little tricky. Um, and it involves that we are the one then who are the more responsible one to decide how to act in the situation and how to handle it, because we know more. And what might happen, I don't know how well developed you are, but I have sometimes come across that I can, for a moment, sort of despise the, and feel some kind of contempt towards the person who doesn't know. And I feel, oh, that's an awful feeling. And realize that, oops, that's my arrogance. And um, in a way, it's good if we can see our arrogance, because usually other people see it before we do. Um, and then, okay, and we all, I think all of us here, we have some bit of arrogance left in us. Um, and I know how, that I have quite a bit. Um, but if we can see, okay, that's my arrogance, uh-uh, and sort of try to climb out of it, and I'll see, how do I solve this situation in the most loving way that I'm able to? And what might motivate us there is that when we manage to do that, then we are sowing, sowing for our own future to be met in a kind and loving way from those who are more developed than we are. So how do I want to be treated by those who have come further than myself? Can be a way. Yeah, and There's also an audience when there is a play, and here it's a bit easier to think of it as, as the spectator, because the spectator here is part of Meg when she reflects over her life. And now let's go back to, to Meg, because she seemed to be satiated with being beautiful and submissive and longs for, to have a larger arena in her life. And she wants to develop her thinking and learn to read. At that time in history, it might not have been so easy to change the scene in the middle of an act. And an act is one lifetime. We spend our, physical, our whole physical lifetime, from cradle to our grave, on stage. Then when we die, we go behind stage into the spiritual world and have a rest. But um, Meg here, she longs for something, for a, a new situation, and perhaps she's not able to, to create it in that lifetime. But listen to what Martino says here. He says that the thoughts, wishes, and longings of the spectator stream into the superconsciousness in the faith element and affect the talent kernels. That's quite a strong statement. So our longing and wishes affect uh, our faith element and actually help to decide or guide where we end up in our next lifetime. Because uh, it'll, we will end up where we well, it's, bit, it's of course, it's extremely complex, but when uh, our longing um, is, for instance, as Meg here, to learn to read and, and uh, use her thinking, um, that will guide where she um, is able to incarnate next time. And then she'll develop new talents that the next time she's born into an incarnation, she will carry them with her. So that, in that way we build new talents, and some talents decrease or degenerate. And maybe she incarnates next time and wants to be a nun. At that time in history, um, that was a way to learn to read and, and to study. So next time, a new scene and a creation of new talents. Now, what about the manuscript um, of each, in, in each incarnation and each act? I mean, if we look at the diversity 
of how life, different lives manifest. I mean, there's an incredible amount of diversity. And we also have many acts, that, uh, many lifetimes, and we need to experience all kinds of things, dying young and dying old and war and peace and being rich and wealthy and being poor and, and starving to death and all kinds. And this, as Martinus says about our manuscript, regarding the way our fate is decided, it should be mentioned that each one of us has a specific objective that we have to achieve in every existence. Before we are given a new physical organism, it is decided in the spiritual world which sum of experiences, which objective we should achieve in this incarnation. Not in an earthly way with notes made in books and ledgers, but they are, on the contrary, decided purely automatically as a result of, among other things, our fate in the previous incarnation, the world plan itself, and the quality and combination of our talent kernels. We therefore, according to our fate, need to achieve a certain sum of experiences in each incarnation, and we need to go through these experiences at all costs. This is from a long, beautiful article called The True Relationship to God, The Secret Closet. And when I read this the first time, I sort of jumped a little bit at that last line. And we need to go through these experiences at all costs. I thought, ooh, <laughs> that sounds a bit dangerous and a bit tough. Um, so, yeah. And again, I sort of, but if I do my best, that must be enough. And also, when we think of what a successful life is from a terrestrial point of view, it's usually being well, healthy, um, having healthy family, uh, well-paid job, good, nice holidays, and, and uh, a good pension. Um, and, of course, that sounds very nice, but from the cosmic point of view and from the point of our cosmic education, um, dying in cancer is just as successful as dying old, of old age and tired of, of life. So, um, we need to remember that the perspective from above is different from the one we perhaps have in our daily life. At an ordinary theatre, there is a backstage with plenty of people uh, working with lights and they work with sound and, and um, stuff needed on stage and they help to dress and, and what, makeup and what have you on the actors, and there's a, just as many people, perhaps even more, backstage than on stage. What about in real life? Is there a backstage? Yes, very much so. With which, um, with all, oh, how do I say it? And without these, the help from backstage, our fates would not work at all. There would not be anything actually taking place. The spiritual world, there we have sub-directors, one could call them, spiritual helpers, organizers of our faith, they sort of say, oh, now it's time there, and now maybe, oh, yes, that fits there. I don't know, I'm just imagining, it seems to be very complex. Um, and Martino says that we are surrounded by more spiritual beings than we are surrounded by physical beings, so they're always there waiting to help, waiting for us to ask for help. And, yeah, when we reach the stage where we start becoming aware of, hmm, maybe I can affect, I can um, influence something in my life, 
um, and, and we want to become better human beings and start to want to wish to cooperate with providence, if we think there is a providence, um, and when we study the spiritual world picture, then we ourselves become assistant directors. Then we really, and he writes that, Martino says that then things speed up. Um, and we also learn to use prayer and can therefore manage have more uh, intense or difficult fates and challenges. But there is always the chief director, the Godhead. And since everybody on stage, uh, apart from ourselves, also are representatives of the Godhead, there are really only two actors. It's ourselves and the Godhead. So it sounds very simple, doesn't it? And in one way it is. In another way it's not at all simple. Now let's see where we go. Yeah. No living being whatsoever can live the life of some other living being or assume its fate. Everyone has its own life, which in every respect is the result of his own desires. He can build up his life to become radiant intellectuality and love for others, but even this condition is, of course, his own fate and not that of his neighbor. Yeah, we have our own fate and not somebody else's. Um, my mother had Alzheimer's illness 15, 15 years before she died, and I found that difficult. I was not quite sort of friends with God in relation to her illness, and could not see the, the meaning of it, um, or not to the extent I wanted. And also when she died, I was not at ease with this. And in a therapy session um, with um, family constellations, Bert Hellinger, it doesn't matter really, um, she, my mother was represented by another person in this session. And I was asking, sort of, what, what's this about? And the answer I got then was that she very firmly stated to me, I want you to respect my fate. Pooh. And I hadn't realized that I was not respecting her fate by being at unease with it. So it was very helpful for me, and I still I carry that with me. And also, I realized, I mean, it's over. For her, that illness was over. She's having a wonderful time in the spiritual world now. Why should I worry then? And I've stopped worrying about that. And this, at least I need to remind myself quite often, that one cannot demand that any individual should think or act upon experiences which he has not yet had. In our criticism of them, or our contempt for them, we are then nearly as foolish as they are themselves. I mean, it's so simple stated like this. But when uh, maybe family members or people who are close to us in some way from our point of view, mess things up really well. And we perhaps find ourselves thinking, oh, couldn't you have thought better? And of course, they couldn't. And maybe we also find ourselves judging or criticizing ourselves when we mess things up. And that is also just as foolish. Yeah. Now, we're going into um, another part of another drama, one that 
is real also, and that took place about 2,000 years ago. No, sorry, there's one more here. Oh, I was going too fast. Yes, to summarize this, who is the actor in all these scenes? Well, the actor starts as in this spiral, then as a mineral being in this world of bliss, with no sense of the physical world, and then evolves to be able to sense the physical world a little bit as a plant being um, rooted in the ground and still in bliss, but learn, uh, developing physical senses. And um, developing further, becoming uh, free, being able to move. And the jellyfish, they have a, a cycle, part of their life cycle, they are as plants on the bottom of the sea. Um, but we see here that they are developing the killing principle, the energy of gravity in their threads that burn and can kill. So, we develop further, becoming more awake and full of senses towards the physical world. And we continue becoming beasts of prey, with very awake and sharp senses, and plenty of the killing uh, principle. And from there, start developing um, intelligence and a little bit of language, and eventually find ourselves as human beings, terrestrial human beings, on our path towards becoming true human beings, finished human beings. And through all this, who is the actor? Yeah, here we have the actor. And where whichever scene we are on, however this part of us, the, the created um, world, changes, is always the same I, the same individual I. Our talent kernels change, the mix of our energies change through all this. Um, and but we are always the same individual I, and we are always connected to each other and to the Godhead through the I. And now, let's go back in history. No, I'm speeding on. I had another quotation, sorry. <laughs> Seemed to be in a hurry. Um, here, Martinez's words. Everything that we have been representing, from mineral, plant, and animal, to terrestrial man, is therefore only a series of masks the I must make use of in speci special situations during the performance of its role in the fate drama. Just as all kinds of fellow beings in the same way constitute the, spe the special masks through which God can manage the clothing of his roles in the many changing settings of the eternal play. They all live their daily lives in the middle of eternity and of infinity, and even their if their experience at present is not the same, no being will experience more light, love and happiness than any other being. And this is the spiral cycles and counts not only for our spiral, but also for our our micro-beings, our organs, our cells, and the, the atoms, molecules, and up into macrocosm with the planet Earth, this solar system, galaxies, and so on, infinitely upwards and infinitely downwards. Now. Let's imagine ourselves 2,000 years back, the Easter drama. Um, when you read Martinez's little book, 
uh, Easter, um, he writes in a way, in part of the book, he writes in a way that really brings us there. Um, and with cosmic consciousness, we can travel. So he could go there and actually look at what happened. And according to Martinez, this story represents a symbolic account in all its details of terrestrial mankind's dilemma on its present stage in development. And the most clear instruction on what, in what direction to move in order to solve our difficulties. And that is forgiveness. So let us have a look at a part of this drama that Martinez describes in an article called Pilot, Christ and Barabbas. And it's not yet translated into English. The story in short is that Judas betrays his master with a kiss. And the men who were sent out by the high priests lead Jesus away. The disciples flee. Peter and Judas follow furtively behind. Peter denies that he has any connection with his master three times before dawn. And the high priests, they discuss what to do further. They see Jesus as a threat to their own power and position in society. And they vaguely sense that, he, that what he is saying to the people is true. And they are afraid that the people are going to join Jesus instead of listening to them and that they will lose their power. So they look for something to accuse him of. They persuade some people to give false testimony and Jesus doesn't answer. Eventually the high priests ask Jesus if he is Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus answers, that is what you've just said. A being who has cosmic consciousness cannot lie. And the high priest then says, this is blasphemy. He deserves to be sentenced to death. They take him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman judge, governor under Herod. And in Palestine at that time, um, they have the tradition to, at Easter, let they liberate the prisoner um, according to the will of the people. And there's a large crowd of people who have gathered in front of Pilate's house. It's agitated through false rumors that the priests have spread about Jesus. And Pilate asks the people, who should I free, Barabbas or Jesus? And Martinus writes that Pilate, he knew that the high priests were afraid of Jesus and that this trial was not a question of power. It was not a question of justice. It was a question of power. And the people shout back, Barabbas. And they do so three times. He asks, he repeats this question three times. And then he asks, what shall I do with Jesus, who calls himself Messiah? And the people shout, crucify him. And Pilate asks, what has he done wrong? The unrest amongst the crowds of people becomes worse. And Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged, whipped, in order to gain the sympathy from the people. But this did not help. And Pilate is clear over the fact that it is totally wrong to crucify Jesus. Pilate is further developed than the general public, Martino says, and he can sense the light and the power in Jesus. And Pilate finds himself in conflict with his conscience. Then the high priests say that they're going to complain to the emperor if Pilate will not crucify Jesus. Pilate has had complaints earlier. Pilate becomes afraid of losing his position, his large, beautiful house, his profession, money, for an uncertain future. Is he willing to risk this? Pilate asks for water to be brought. 
he washes his hands before the people and says, I am innocent of the death of this man. So Pilate saves his own skin, sets Barabbas free, and lets Jesus be taken away to be crucified. And one can see this as a moving story about giving one's life for mankind, the story as, as a whole. And Martinez says that, I'll come to that shortly. Um, and as Martinez says, a symbolic description of the ordinary terrestrial human being. And we'll come back to that and the expression of an eternal law. And this eternal cosmic, um, this law is cosmic and eternal, and it is what takes place everywhere in the universe where God transforms animal beings into true human beings. So this process of going from being an animal to becoming a finished human being, is governed by this cosmic law that is expressed in this uh, drama. And the first interpretation of this law was the, or is the, the um, gospel of Easter. And Martinez also says that um, this story whether one believes in it or not, does not matter. And whether it sort of really happened or not, does not either matter. But if it hadn't happened, and if it wasn't true, if it didn't represent this cosmic law, it would have faded away and never reached us. And he says that also a person that denies that Christ or God exists, they still uh, go under this law. And this, these three main characters, Pilate, Christ, and Barabbas, are represented in all of us. And Martino says that we juggle with them every day, several times a day. And Barabbas represents the animal aspect of our mentality, hatred, revenge, desire for power, irritation, um, despise, and so on. And Christ, of course, uh, represents the friendship in us, the forgiveness, tolerance, and everything that dissolves darkness. And then Pilate, he's the judge in us who decides which is to rule. Are we choosing to let set Barabbas free in ourselves, or are we choosing to let set Christ free in ourselves? And of course, in our lives, it's not such a such dramatic situation as described in this. But um, we still um, have these choices. And, um, yeah, these three roles express the mentality or psyche of modern man. And the mentality of Pilate is the one that dominates. And Pilate decides how much of Christ and how much of Bar Barabbas comes into expression. And Pilate has, to, to some degree, grown out of Barabbas and thinks it's all that's primitive. Um, but is not the um, Christ being in us is not uh, trustworthy enough. And Pilate is not um, trust, does not always see or does not always trust that it's okay to choose Christ, mainly due to um, fear of what the flock is going to say, what other people will say. And also, he says that we are often prepared to 
set Christ free if, it's, if we're not risking anything, if we're not risking our reputation or money or um, objects of any kind, our car or whatever, um, then we can be prepared to use Christ, set Christ free in ourselves. But when there's a risk, as it was for Pilate, we often step back and instead we release Barabbas. And um, yeah, we also have a tendency to sympathize with Christ, but punish and execute the Barabbas in ourselves and in others. An example of that is that we, and we use our own Barabbas to punish other Barabbases, such as when we um, believe that if I shout on my children, they'll behave better. <laughs> um, and then I'm using Barabbas on small Barabbases, and things just become worse. And also when we try to create peace by using war, and believe that we can help uh, no, believe, we shoot terrorists before we even know whether they are the ones guilty of the attack or not. Then why then do we not set Christ free in ourselves more? Well, it's not just a question of will. Of course, it's a question of development. So when we set Barabbas free, uh, we obviously need more experiences of meeting Barabbas. Well, that's what we sow, and that is what we will reap. Um, and therefore, we will experience more of what it's like to be hit by Barabbas, such as a boss that is unfair uh, in our workplace, and maybe doesn't use his might instead of right, and doesn't talk to his employees to find out what has really happened. And uh, the situation where we are most prone to misuse power and therefore be a Barabbas is when we are in a superior position. We are much more aware of uh, superiority from below, because from there it's more painful. And as bosses or as being superior, we are not always sure, uh, aware of when we trod on people. It's much easier. So therefore, the karma then works so that we'll experience both and eventually want nothing other than equality and kindness. Yeah, so I would say that it pays to try to become aware of one's Barabbas, Christ and Pilate. To stop and think, pray for guidance, sleep before taking, making decisions. And uh, in this... In an article called Christ, no, Pilate, Christ and Barabbas, uh, Martinez writes about standing up for our, um, our conviction about life. Uh, if we st uh, he, he says that that these people, I'll come back to who they are, because it's us. <laughs> um, these people have in common with Nicodemus that they, like him, only come to Jesus during the night. This means that they do not openly dare to admit that they, in their view of life, depart from the flock or the religion or the view of the majority, the view of life of the majority. Therefore, they cultivate their new sphere of interest furtively or secretly. So I can ask myself, do I stand up for my conviction concerning Martina's world picture? Uh, or do I perhaps hide it unnecessarily well? And is it always out of love and consideration that I am or we uh, are quiet about it. Or maybe do we perhaps talk about it without people having asked for it? So we can... Yeah, Martinus says that we are like Nicodemus if we, are, if we risk something. I remember once I was working at a school 
And um, I was passing on my way uh, somewhere. I was passing some teachers and the headmaster who was sitting talking. And I sort of heard, oh, somebody saying that, oh, reincarnation, oh, that's stupid. I don't want to become a frog in the next lifetime. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I asked myself afterwards, should I have stopped? And said, psst, there are much more logical and fine explanations for reincarnation than that, if you're interested. <laughs> but I didn't. Maybe next time. I don't know. Yeah, here we are. One is afraid of being scorned, afraid of losing one's friends. One is afraid of the so-called public, public opinion of the flock. One lets oneself be seduced to execute or mutilate the mentality of Christ in oneself. While one liberates Barabbas, that is, the bandit or murderer in one's own being. What is most important is to think about not crucifying the little Christ child that you carry within you. Human beings crucify themselves when they create causes that when they come back destroy their lives, for instance through taking unhealthy stimulants or having incorrect or derailed ways of thinking. An area in which an infinite number of human beings murder, kill and mutilate on a daily basis is with their gift of speech. Words are the last murder weapons that human beings will put down. To deliver degrading or apparently com compromising news about other human beings is murder. I think of that sometimes now, this becomes perhaps trivial, but um, you know, in the, super, in the queue in the supermarket, when you stand waiting, and there's the uh, place where there are these magazines. Um, I don't know what you call them in English, but it's where famous and, and uh, movie stars and famous people, their scandals and divorces and what have you are, are on show, so to say. And when I stand there, I sort of look at these headlines or head, um, yeah, headlines, and, and then I feel a bit bad and think of what Martino says about this. And I've just realized what I can do next time is to pray for them instead, the people that are on the headlines. But that's the kind of thing that without this world picture, one doesn't realize what one is doing. I also remember taking part in personnel meetings where the employer is not there, and people are so angry, and they are talking so badly about these people, and sort of how to trod on this and try to create peace. Challenging. Yeah, one crucifies oneself by persecuting and crucifying others. And it is the case that when one liberates Christ in one's own mentality, even though it first will lead to a crucifixion, there will after this crucifixion unfailingly come a morning of resurrection. This is from the Grand course. It's not just translated. Now that I'm talking this much about prayer, it is because it is of such a colossal necessity. Human beings have been given as a fatherly gift such a divine power that can lift them out of everything. It can lift them out of the most severe depressions. Once they have discovered this power, this wonderful power, discovered this connection and realized that their eye is one with all other eyes. At that point, they feel the same love to those they could not bear earlier. 
They feel love to everything that earlier irritated and plagued them. We're nearly there now. I know it's getting late. Prayer has a great magic that can be used when one, being, when one begins to want to live in the correct way and wants to create a way of being worthy of the perfect human being. There is so much help to be found through prayer. There are entire worlds of invisible beings that have their, uh, as their only task to help mankind, but one can only come into contact with them by tuning into their wavelength. And the more we are fr friends with our fate and our scene, the act we're in, the more easy it is to find this wavelength. It appears then automatically. But whatever act and scene we are in, however our life looks, life is life and cannot be anything other than life. Life cannot die. That which is living has been eternally living and will in all eternity continue to be living. Thank you.